following on from um, Jane's last remark, so I'm, I'm, I think I've been asked here as one of two speakers today to speak um, as someone who, who's an unformed member of the SWP, and I'll, I'll be speaking about the 60s and um, <coughs> sessions on the roots of 1968, very much through um, the prism of the international socialists and how the IS saw them. And how I'll do that today is through um, a rereading of a book which has always meant an enormous amount to me, which is David Witchery's book, The Left in Britain, 1956-68, to 68, which for people who don't know it is, is in a sense um, the nearest thing that we have to a sort of an official IS history of the 60s, um, or at least an official IS history of the 60s written during the 60s and in its immediate aftermath. There'll be three themes which I'll speak to. The first is, um, and again I think this follows on from Jane's remarks, is that... Um, is it in Widgery's account, um, IS isn't portrayed as a party which is separate from the revolutionary milieu of the 60s, but as part of it. There's very little sense in it of, of an attempt to differentiate that left current from the left generally. The second thing, which for those of us in the room who've left the SWP recently, and I do count at least half a dozen faces as I look around, um, one of the things which is interesting about Widgery's book is there's a very... Um, a very weak sense of an IS tradition. Um, there isn't an idea that there was an IS tradition already visible or present in the 60s and separate um, from the rest of the revolutionary left. And the third point I'll be making is that, um, um, perhaps counterintuitively, um, if you read Widgery closely, what I suppose, um, on my reading he's saying, is that a, a distinct IS way of doing politics does emerge, but it emerges only in or perhaps actually slightly after 1968. So, and obviously, of course, while, while all my comments are going to be addressed overwhelmingly to IS, um, I hope they do shed light on the activities of other groups on the left which faced the same challenges at the time. Now, developing the point of, of the notion of a revolutionary milieu, um, first published by Penguin in 1976, the left in Britain is a collection of around 55 pamphlets, speeches, articles, newsletters, and so on. And it purports to tell the story of the left between, and really not in 1956, there's very little about the CP crisis and the splintering, which after all gave rise to the first new left, but from about 1957 to 1968. So it's telling, um, through participants' own words, the story of the 60s, with really a very light editorialising. In essence, um, there's an introduction by um, Widgery's fellow sort of dissident IS, uh, Peter Sedgwick. Mm. Then there are very short um, intros to each section. But actually, if there's an editorial voice, it's, it's mainly um, apparent through um, the end notes and the glossary, which sort of alternate between the tone of this breathless, um, train spotter style left wing enthusiast and a, a tone of complete derision and sarcastic invective directed towards any of, of Widgery's um, enemies. But I, I just thought I'd give a, a nice um, line or two, just give an instance of the former, the train spotter mode, which was Widgery talking about caste. Because I noticed they do get an entry. Yeah. Um, and the first four sentences are very similar to what we've heard. The, the, um, it mentions again the Harold um, Muggins um, tour and, and, and the role of the ESC. But the last two sentences, he adds, have produced an unreleased film concerning Muggins' visit to the planet of the apes <laughs> and a minority tendency cartoon clans absconded in 1973. <laughs> so um, that notion of the vociferousness of the left isn't, isn't entirely new. Now, one of the, when Witchery wrote the book, he had, in a sense he had a choice. He, he could have written it um, solely or primarily um, as a story of, of, of IS's journey through the 1960s. And there had been other collections which had already been published by, that, by then by IS, IS, which had done that. There was a Jim Higgins um, book which had come out in 1965, which was a collection of articles from um, the magazine Socialist Review. There had been a collection of theoretical pieces, World Crisis, in 1971, edited by Nigel Harris and John Palmer and containing longer theoretical articles by the likes of Tony Cliff, uh, Michael Kidder and Paul Foote. When you go back to the left in Britain, he chose to write it differently, and, and the, the writing decisions, um, I'd say, are significant. Um, of the 55 pieces, um, on my count, 20 
um, were written um, by IS's or XIS's. And even that 20, um, you need, again, the train spotter's knowledge to spot some of them as former um, IS's. Um, Sheila Rowbottom, of course, who wasn't only um, a former IS by any means, but was a member of um, several different groups involved in lots and several different projects in the long 1960s. And Bob Rothorn, um, both of those two, I think, um, probably included just as much for their membership of um, the select circle of Widgery's close friends, rather than the fact that each of them had been in IS for a year or so. Reading it, what it really reads like to me is, is if you can imagine an event like, for example, the Marxism conferences, but imagine them put on 40 or 50 years earlier and with this sort of um, a non-sectarian um, booking committee deliberately choosing people from lots of different left-wing tendencies. That's how, how the book reads. There's a gathering of people from across the tendencies. Some names, some big names. Edward Thompson and John Savile, the editors of Socialist Register, who in effect had founded the first New Left by breaking from the Communist Party in 56 to 57. Peggy Duff of CND, Alex Comfort of the Committee of 100, the striking Hull Seaman, of course, um, including a young John Prescott, I wonder what happened to him, who Harold Wilson had smeared in 1966 as a tightly knit group of politically motivated men. It's also interesting if you read it, it's not just the top table, it goes, it calls down into the left, um, which includes um, Ken Weller of Solidarity, arguing against um, both Soviet and British bonds, Brian Behan on the um, South Bank building dispute, and his fellow building worker activist, Lou Lewis, who of course later went on to become a patron of the younger generation of building worker activists who recently led um, the Black Lives Support Group, the Spark Strike, and so on. Rose Boland of the Ford Equal Pay Strike and the Revolutionary um, Socialist Student Federation. <coughs> now, um, there are some um, people from the IMG present in the room today, I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll quote Ken Coates, um, the founder of the International <laughs> Group, um, and his review um, of Widgery's book in Socialist Register. It, it starts, of course, by bashing Widgery um, relentlessly for a series of factual errors. Um, which there's a sort of code going on. In, in essence, that, that Ken Coates, of course, had been, um, I think he'd been 24 in 1956, so he'd been a serious participant in the first New Left. Um, Widgery had been nine. <laughs> and as ever, the people who weren't there, um, who hold our collective hands up, do often get things wrong. But um, he, he went on um, quite robustly to describe the book as an act of cultural imperialism. <laughs> Attempting to incorporate all of the post-1956 British New Left under the hegemony of the international socialists, a rather shrill, if also intellectually infertile, sectarian grouping. Um, now, the accusation's not groundless. I mean, I'm reading the book in exactly the same way. The Left in Britain is... is um, as a subtle party history of the 1960s. Um, but I suppose the difference is, as I'm emphasising the subtlety of, of, the, of the dynamic, which is trying to tell IS as being part of, not separate from the rest of the revolutionary left. Now, um, I'm going to skip a bit now, because I'm, I'm sort of... Um, um, I, don't want to, to, I don't want to go over time. Um, I want to talk about tradition. I was, I was going to do this... Um, through a, con through a, a contrast between um, two different notions of tradition um, that appear in the book. One, one's a notion which is, um, comes um, originally um, from Edward Thompson in the CP, from the popular front turn in the CP in the 1930s, and from the attempt to recreate a sort of narrative of English radicalism. You can find Widgery um, selectively does quote from that, that both... Um, um, as a description of tradition and from its own traditionalising. So, so, for example, the book, um, um, it opens with three quotations. One is the famous um, William Morris quotation about men um, and women set off um, to make the history. What they create doesn't come about, but it does come about under a new name. I'm not going to go through Thompson. I don't think I have time to it. But, but if you just have that as a sort of vestigial counterpart to what I now say about um, the notion of IS tradition which appears in the book which it does um, immediately after um, quoting Thompson on tradition which he then goes then 
um, extracts of the text of speech by Tony Cliff on revolutionary traditions. And for those of us, again, who've been through um, the SWP, this is important because um, one of the things that we've heard relentlessly, it feels, in the last couple of years is the notion of an IS tradition, um, with perhaps some slight mystique as to what actually this IS tradition is. <laughs> What's really interesting when you see Wichery quoting Cliff is that the, 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 this, this Cliff speech, which was the original formulation of a notion of bias tradition, um, bends the stick, as of course Cliff was wont to, but it bends it against the idea of traditionalising or against the idea of merely looking backwards into the past um, for, a, for a sense of tradition in which to root yourself. Um, and this is a speech, but I'm not going to do the Palestinian accent. This is Cliff. Those that simply speak in the name of tradition are bloody useless. Because what really happens, happened like the German Social Democrats in 1914. They quoted Marx and Engels from 1848. Marx and Engels said in 1848, yes, we in Germany should carry the battle against Tsarist Russia. And the Social Democrats got up in 1914 and they said, as Marx and Engels said, we have to carry the battle against Tsarist Russia. And that's why they supported the war in 1914. In other words, the danger of tradition is the danger of death. And then Cliff followed this up with another passage, which, Widgery, which is again in Widgery's book, with this insistence there was barely any such thing as an IS tradition separable from the rest of the left. The IS group's tradition is a very simple one. In reality, we've changed all the time. I thank heaven for that. Our basic ideas are taken really from an old, old revolutionary tradition. And again, those of us who've been in SWP recently can attest to the different universe into which its recruits are now schooled. One in which the virtues of the tradition overwhelm the past, and all that was done in previous years is portrayed as having been consistent and correct. And the only thing missing is a sense of what actually to do in the relatively um, disappointing and politically impoverished present. Now, my third point is about when and how IS distinguished itself from the rest of its revolutionary milieu, or in a sense, when the notion of an IS tradition starts. Because, of course, it would have been open to Widgery to have included in his book um, such pieces as Michael Kidron's work on what he first called the permanent war economy, or Tony Cliff on state capitalism, deflected permanent revolution, etc. One reason I think that Widgery didn't do this was his intimation that what was about to matter to IS in 1968 and onwards wasn't these theories which had been formulated in the period when IS had been very small, and when the theories had had amongst their functions a role in marking IS out and its predecessor out as being different from other left competitors, in a sense protecting the small group from the hostile world around them. Rather, what he grasped is that what would count in the future for IS, or indeed for any other group on the left, was a capacity for enthusiasm in the moment, which reached its peak in Britain under the influence of the events of 1968 in France, which seemed to prove the possibility in, a, in richer advanced countries too of the possibility of a 1917-style revolution. Dave Kellaway of Socialist Resistance captured this spirit in a recent article, um, not, not in the sense just about IS, but he refers to IS and the SWP. He says, whether because of or in spite of such theories as state capitalism, pun, arms economy, etc., the fact is that ISSWP related to the working class more effectively than the old international Marxist group. It was less intellectual and developed a press with a real impact. The brochures on incomes policy in the 70s sold tens of thousands and helped the SWP build a base among the shop stewards movement. And then Kellaway also credits work done in the anti Nazi League and Stop the War. Now, insofar as Widgery's book provides historical analysis of the period from 56 to 68, it's that in 1956 the left's of opportunities have been limited to the accumulation of minorities. I think you could hear this again in what James was saying, the description of, of an activist family schooled in the best of the left, but without, without a movement of the thousands around it in the 1950s, as might have been possible within a decade. By 1968, the non-Stalinist left was now in what Peter Sedgwick's introduction described as an age of majorities. The difference between the two was about the change in class composition of the far left and the potential for causes to join and give rise to mass movements. The last era of the independent left, from 1956 to roughly 1970, can be termed the age of minorities, Sedgwick wrote. 
The strength of radical demonstration, whether numbered in hundreds or in scores of thousands, reflected the ingathering of local weaknesses, tiny, powerless groups who in their own train were unable to win the mass of people around them, except perhaps in the temporary euphoria of one college or one workshop. This old way of doing politics, Sedgwick announced, had been tested by powerlessism, by the redundancies of the mid and late 60s and failed. Now the left had to organise on a different scale. We've all fled from the tasks of the socialist campaign, as Sedgwick wrote, into the peculiar satisfactions of the prophet or the administrator, the minimal shop steward or the archetypal student leader, the paper-selling wanderer or the paper-reading follower. These postures are so much less demanding, so much more fulfilling in the short term than the role of active ferment amongst a group of people who see us every working day, know us by name and by face, and will call us to account for every word and action. The socialist must join the workers' movement as a trade unionist in his own right, with card rulebook and box of anti-management tricks, undergoing the same problems in skill and morale and leadership as those he's addressing. His politics must be open, not regurgitated by the yard. The crowning aim of the age of majorities is to construct, within the working class, a majority of conscious socialists. Now, for me and perhaps other people who've gone through the same immediate history as me in the last couple of years, these are different, difficult passages to reread re now. They're difficult because of our knowledge of how IS and SWP was going to end up as a party which misused the activist imperative to deflect attention from the mistakes of its leadership, which used that sense of the urgency and excitement, which misused it. And indeed, Sedgwick would be, um, I suppose, like the canary who goes down in the pit and the first, the first person to notice that process of the suffocation of an overused hyperactivity, leaving IS just two years later in 1978, um, which of his book was, of course, published in 76. Sed Sedgwick left in 78 when IS changed its name to the SWP. But that history acknowledged the transition Sedgwick was speaking for were ones which were as much needed then as they are now. At some point, the left will need to make those shifts, as it did 35 years ago, from the purely national perspective to local plans to give that perspective meaning, from the politics of radicalism to politics of class, and from a way of doing politics appropriate to a time of defeats, to one capable of a time of victories.